All right, I want to spend uh, some time, a little more time right now, to go into some of the points that came out of yesterday's oral arguments in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. There's a lot that came out, uh, but we'll try to hone in on a few of the key points. Joining me now to, uh, to help with this dissection is uh, Congressman Mike Johnson, who is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, a top-ranked Republican for its subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. He also has uh, two decades of previous experience in constitutional law. He represents the 4th Congressional District of Louisiana. And on top of all that, he's known me for about 30 years. So, uh, Mike, welcome back to the program. Hey, Tony, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Okay, let's... Uh, I want to focus in on a couple of things because I think the left was running scared yesterday. Um, you know, they weren't, I think what's happened, they no longer have the cover of an activist court to protect this house of judicial cards that they've been building all of this on. Justice Sotomayor was asking, you know, these questions repeatedly of uh, Scott Stewart, the uh, Solicitor General from Mississippi, about the advancements in medicine that we've uh, had over the past three or four decades. So let's play uh, that clip. I want to play that clip. So go ahead and play that one. What are the advancements in medicine? I think it's a, an advancement in, in knowledge and concern about such things as uh, fetal pain, what we know the child is doing and looks like and is fully human you know, from a very early... In, oh, in regular cases, courts decide whether science fits the Daubert standard. Obviously, the, under the Daubert standard, the minority of people, a, a gross minority of doctors, who believe fetal pain exists before 24, 25 weeks, it's a huge minority, and one not well-founded in science at all. So um, I don't see how that really adds anything to the discussion. That a small fringe of doctors believe that pain could be experienced before a cortex is formed. Clearly trying to get away from the science because, as you have argued, abortion cases from Louisiana in the courts, science is on the side of the pro-life argument. Look, this is not 1973. And as has been pointed out at the time that Roe was decided, I mean, that was almost 50 years ago, you know. Um, if you looked at an ultrasound in, in 1973, it really was blurry. You, you couldn't really tell what you were looking at. Well, now, Tony, as you and I both know and everyone knows, we have 4D ultrasounds. I mean, there's no question about the humanity of an unborn child from the earliest stages. And the reason that Mississippi uh, set the line at 15 weeks, it, they, they, they arguably could have said it earlier, uh, but they, they, were, they were trying to illustrate the point that this is where the medical technology makes it irrefutable, that you have a child, of course, after you have a heartbeat so early on in the pregnancy, after they're, they're capable of feeling pain and all these other indicators, that's just further affirmation of what we know now, that medical science absolutely proves that from the moment of conception, you have a tiny, tiny human being, and they refuse to acknowledge that on the other side. Yeah, when we talk about 15 uh, weeks, you know, I like to kind of unpack that a little bit. That's almost four months of pregnancy. You know, most people think yeah. of pregnancy in terms of months, not weeks, um, unless you're a mother, you're counting the weeks. But most of us look at it at nine months. I mean, that's, that's halfway through the pregnancy we're talking about. And as you said, fully formed. And what she was pushing back on was the, uh, the, the science that has shown uh, in, in over the last decade and a half that children in the womb feel pain and they respond to it. And she went down this absurd path of equating babies in utero with dead people responding to stimuli, which I was, I just was shocked that that's how desperate they are to hold on to, to Roe. Everyone was shocked by that. I, I've just left the house floor. We're in the middle of a vote series tonight. And my colleagues were discussing that very comment by Justice Sotomayor, one of the nine justices in the Supreme Court. It's shocking that their, their arguments and their support for Roe and its progeny are so vapid, right? They're, they're so empty. They have nothing left to stand on. Everyone recognizes that this is a legal fiction, that the Constitution of the United States clearly does not confer a right to abortion, period, end, end of sentence. And, and because of that, we have for almost a half century perpetuated this legal fiction at great cost. Of course, 63 million or more unborn children. Tony, 
I turned 50 in January. I'm just a year older than Roe. If you look at the numbers and you consider the staggering magnitude of this, I mean, think about it. At least one third or more, somewhere between one third and one half of my entire generation is not here. Uh, Tony, my high school graduating class should have been twice as large as it was, right? Everybody who's 50 years of age and younger, we're missing half of our cohort. We're missing our peers. And, and the this, this staggering magnitude of it, just, just it should settle on everyone. So they're making these strained legal arguments and, and trying to thread a needle that everyone knows is wrong. It's long past time that we get beyond this tragedy and, and, and fix what has ailed all of our constitutional jurisprudence since they created this legal fiction in 1973. Yeah, and, and that's where I want to hone in on for a moment is because I, I think I could almost, I couldn't see them because all I heard was audio, but I could I could sense the fear in their voices uh, and, and in their questioning, especially as she attached Roe to all of these other cases, Griswold, Lawrence, Obergefell, fearful that this judicial activism, if they let it go in Roe, could make all of these other cases vulnerable, where they snatched issues away from the American people in the democratic process and said, we know better than you, and we're going to solve this issue, which we know is not true, because 50 years later, we're still having uh, actually a more intense debate over abortion than we were in 1973. That's exactly right. I mean, one of her arguments there was, gee, that we don't want the court to be political and make a political decision. I mean, it's almost laughable. It, of course, there are advocates on both sides, but that's kind of the point. Look, the, the principle uh, behind all of this that, that no one should ever lose sight of in spite of all the rhetoric in the midst of all of it is remember this. If the Constitution is silent to an issue such as this, it is not the job of unelected judges on the Supreme Court to make the decision. It is supposed to be in the purview of the people themselves, and that is through their duly elected representatives and the legislative branch of government in the states. That is a, one of the foundational principles of our constitutional order, our constitutional republic. And when Roe was decided, they took a hatchet to that principle. And, and to restore it means that we restore constitutional order, the original meaning of the Constitution, what, what it was intended, how our system of government was intended to work. It is the right of the people to make these decisions. And, and through their duly elected representatives who are accountable to those people and not judges who we can never uh, touch or, or question. And, and I think people are waking up and recognizing that. And that's going to be a good day in America when we can get this corrected. That was essentially the opening argument for, for, from the Solicitor General of Mississippi saying, look, this is, should be left with the people to decide these tough, hard issues. And I think in part, and you tell me what you see as a, uh, you know, observer of the court, one who's actually been in the court there arguing, when you look at what Justice Kavanaugh had to say, zeroing in on that very issue, it suggests to me that he understands and we may have the majority on the court ready to put these issues back where they belong with the state legislatures. That's right. You know, uh, many of us were very encouraged by the, the questions asked by Justice Kavanaugh. He was one who some people thought there may be a question mark over where would he be on the issue. And, and I think he went right to the heart of it. And, and he listed, as you know, a, a number of decisions, 12 or 15 or so, I lost count, of, of cases that overruled previous opinions of the court that were wrong. And so this idea of stare decisis, you know, the, the fancy legal word that says you must follow case precedent, is not actually always true. And there are times in the history, and there have been many times in our history as a nation, where we have had to correct a past uh, error by the court. And, and this is certainly one of them. And I, I think by the questions that Kavanaugh asked, Justice Kavanaugh, I, I think that's a very good indication where he is. And I count at least five votes now, Tony. That's, that's my prognostication. Uh, that, that that we may be very, very well be able to overturn Roe with this. And uh, hopefully there'll be six. I, there's some question, I think, still about where Justice Roberts may be, but I don't think that he wants this opinion to be five to four. That's my guess. I mean, uh, it, all of our guesses are as good as they are. But having watched the court a long time and knowing these justices, I, 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 think, we're in, I think we have a high degree of confidence that something is about to change. This is Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana is joining me from Capitol Hill. You hear that uh, noise in the background. That's not a fire alarm. That's uh, their voting indication. You got to vote on the floor here. I know you got to run here in just a moment. But let me ask you this question. I think, this is my view, if the court were to 
rule, as we've been describing, putting this back to the states. I see this as a path for the court to detangle itself from politics and actually restore competence in the court that it is not a uber legislative body. What a healthy outcome that would be. You know, part of the problem that we have right now is that the American people are losing their faith in our institutions. They're losing their faith, as I was arguing with Attorney General Merrick Garland before the, uh, the Judiciary Committee a few weeks ago, that the great danger of, of weaponizing the Department of Justice or, or allowing the court to act like the super legislature is that the people lose faith in their institutions. They lose faith in the idea that justice is blind, that it really, it really is equal justice under law, as is inscribed on the marble above the court. Um, these, are, these are critical principles to have to maintain a constitutional republic. We're still trying to keep this republic. We have to remember always, and you and I talk about a lot, we're still an experiment on the world stage. We're only 245 years into this grand experiment of self-governance. But one of the underpinnings, one of the foundations of that is the belief that our, our system of justice actually works as designed. We've gotten away from that in recent decades, and we must get back to it, back to that foundational principle. I, I think we can. I'm an optimist. I think we had a great day in court yesterday, and I think good things are ahead. And I think this is a shot in the arm to state legislatures where policies should be decided. You and I both background in the Louisiana legislature. Um, I, I've always been uh, kind of biased toward in favor of state legislatures because I think that's where the process is closest to the people to decide these issues. And, 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 and I know you were very much involved in Louisiana in advancing the life issue as I did when I was there. And I think that effort, oftentimes in uh, you know, receiving criticism from some saying, now's not the time, don't do it, the court will strike it down. I'm grateful that we have seen state legislators pushing forward on these issues, forcing the hand of the court. And I think, and this is probably what the left is afraid of, that you'll see states that will reassert themselves in many of these issues, and the left will lose the leverage that they've had through the courts. I, I think that's exactly what they're fearful of, uh, because they know that their, their, their policies are not popular. I mean, we see that in every polling uh, now nationwide on all these big issues. But now, because of the advancement of med medical technology, because of all these, these factors that we've talked about that are different than they were 50 years ago, people recognize you're not talking about a blob of tissue. You're talking about an unborn child, a human being, and there is inherent value to that. And of course, let's always remember our founding principle is articulated in the Declaration. It's a self-evident truth that we're created by God and he's the one that gives us our rights. It begins, obviously, with the right to life. When the American people recognize that, they can empower their legislators to act accordingly, and that is exactly how the system was designed to work. I've, I found it interesting that uh, some of the uh, the talking heads overnight have said, well, this is simply going to uh, really energize the Democratic base going into the midterm elections. You know, I don't see that because they don't they can't do anything legislatively. They've you know, Congress has been talking about or the Democrats have been talking about codifying Roe, knowing that this was coming in the courts and they've not had the ability to do that. So. I don't see why people would go out and support the Democrats because they can't do anything in Congress. If anything, I see this as fueling the support for pro-life conservatives at the state level who will now take on this issue if, in fact, it comes back to them from the courts. I think that's right. And there will be a lot of important work to be done. Just just uh, overturning Roe is not the end of the battle. It's the beginning. Now, I'm grateful to be from Louisiana, one of the dozen states or so that will, that has a trigger law that will automatically become a, an abortion-free state, pro-life. Uh, and there's a number of states that will join us. But of course, there's a number of states that are going the opposite direction as well. And there are many states who will, will have yet to address the question comprehensively on the state level. So there's a, there's a lot of work to be I do think it energizes the base, and I, I think it's going to be good uh, for the party, but more importantly, it'll be good for the principle of what's right and what we should That's be right. pursuing. That's right, and for our republic. Congressman Mike Johnson, no, you got to go vote. Thanks so much for uh, taking time to join us this afternoon. Great to talk to you. Thanks, Tony. You too. Keep it up. All right. Uh